Hi everyone, I'm Ben, welcome back to my channel. Today I'm reviewing The Overstory by Richard Powers and it is very, very good. So good in fact that I think it could change the way you think about the natural world and your relationship to it. Let me tell you why in five parts. Part one, Weeping for Willows. I want to ground my personal interest in this book with a story. So a few months ago I read in my local newspaper that two huge willow trees had been chopped down to make way for a new development. These trees were a stone's throw from the office that I work in and they stood on the banks of the harbour, their branches dangling over the water. On a sunny day I'd often sat by them and have my lunch. I hadn't done anything to help save these trees and to be honest it was too late by the time I even found out that this was happening. But I felt a profound sadness about them being felled and I couldn't quite pinpoint why. Sure, like the obvious answer is that trees are beautiful and taking beautiful things out of our public spaces is a net negative. But we don't have a problem with cutting down most trees. Um, the book that I'm reviewing is made out of a tree and it's sat in front of me on a table that is made of wood. So why was I particularly sad about these specific trees? Well, I think Richard Powers has opened my eyes to why I felt like that. But to understand the book, I think we need to understand first the man who wrote it. Part two, the backstory. Richard Powers is an American writer and the author of 13 novels. He's a bit of a polymath, that kind of multi-talented public intellectual we don't see many of these days in our hyper-specialised world. His works address in some depth some of the things that he's most interested in. Things like music, game theory, artificial intelligence, and more recently, the natural world. In 2003, the New York Times described him as the preeminent literary chronicler of the technological age, and he gave himself the label the science guy. That's evolved over time. In an interview with Ezra Klein, he said he used to be interested in the sciences that amplify our ability to control and master and manipulate. Now, in his 50s and 60s, he's become interested in the humbling sciences that point our attention away from ourselves and onto other living things. That transition also ended up with him moving from the cradle of modern technology, Silicon Valley, out to the Rocky Mountains. He'd visited when he was researching the overstory and he said it had a profound impact on him, upending his notion of what makes a forest and how alive it is. That wonder stayed with him and eventually he made the call to move there full time. I believe that in the overstory he manages to translate that wonder for us, the readers, over the course of its 600 pages. Part 3. A Book in the Shape of a Tree Part of the majesty of this book is in its construction. Its opening section, Roots, is a captivating 190 pages that introduces each of our characters and sets out their backgrounds and starting positions. Pawns on a grassy chessboard. Each character has some intimate connection with trees. Patricia studies them, Nicholas's family takes pictures of the same one for generations, and Ray plays Macbeth attacked by some fake ones from Burnham Wood in a community theatre production. These stories are absolutely brilliant and you could close the book on page 191 and be completely satisfied with what you've read. And yet Powers uses this as a jumping off point to explore how these roots come together, intertwining and overlapping for the remaining 400 pages of the book. Not all of these characters meet, um, sometimes their interactions are incredibly brief or just by chance, but they are always meaningful and realistic. They fight for and come to appreciate nature and trees in their own ways at their own volumes. And while spinning this tale, Powers and his characters dispense profound insights about the natural world. Ones that I think about every day as I walk through a park on the way to work, or I see roots pushing up through the alien world of our built environment. One example that has stayed with me is that of the fallen tree. Something we humans often see as a thing to be cleared, to be manicured out of our idea of a perfect forest. And yet in this book, it's described as a life giver all its own, a hub for myriad other organisms. A fallen tree is not dead, and in many ways, it is even more alive. The writing in this book is beautiful and sumptuous and earnest, um, and also at times funny, like it is very empathetic, but it has a turn of phrase that will put a smile on your face now and again. In my opinion, Richard Powers is an absolute master of language. Part four, The Altar of the Forest. I've read and heard some criticism that this book can be too preachy, that it can repeat the same facts over and over. But I wonder, how can you not preach about a world so miraculous? How can you not remind your readers again and again of the mind-blowing conception of a forest as a single, enormous organism? How can you mention the communication lines of mycelia between trees just once, when it is a metaphor writ large for all natural life on this planet? We wouldn't criticise other authors for mentioning love too much, or for too many mentions of grief. 
For me, the constant reminders of the world around these characters and the things they believe in only strengthened the wonder. I now go about my day-to-day -day life with a different appreciation for the living, growing, constantly interacting world around me. You might feel differently, of course. Part five, hope. I've thought a lot about whether I think this novel is a hopeful one. By the end of the book, despite everything, humanity is not really any further along in undoing its pillaging of the natural world. Not really much further along in even recognising it. And while there are certainly moments of existential dread, I do think that ultimately this story is a hopeful one, just not in the way that we usually think of hope. Powers borrows some metaphors from the scientific world to make some of his points, and one that stuck out and really blown my mind a bit is the Earth's history in 24 hours. It goes a bit something like this. If Earth's history were condensed into 24 hours, life would have appeared at 4am, land plants at 10.24pm, dinosaur extinction at 11.41pm, and human history would have begun at 11.58 and 43 seconds p.m. It is not then Earth that is in trouble, it's us, and by extension, all the life that is affected and depends on us. Life has existed long before we were here and will exist long after. The natural world is one of balance, and while my strong preference is that we save what we have, it's kind of comforting to know that in millions of years' time, life will almost certainly be thriving on this planet. It might just look a bit different. In the end, history may judge this novel by how many minds it manages to change, how many it manages to convince that the natural world is a wonder worth sacrificing our current path to save. It is, after all, a huge novel and has sold a lot of copies. More trees will have been cut down and pulped and printed on to get these stories into our collective brains than most others. An irony not lost on Richard Powers as he mentions it in the book. But for my money, I think this is absolutely successful. It's a prescient masterpiece that we'll one day wish we'd have listened to and truly understood sooner. I highly, highly recommend you read it. So that's the first sort of slightly deeper single book review that I've done. Um, let me know if you enjoyed it and if you did, give this video a thumbs up. If you'd like to see more of my content now is a great time to subscribe, but until next time, toodles!